Chapter 7 of The Airship Boys in the Great War by Delisle F. Kess. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Hirsch. Chapter 7 What Happened to Ned. Alan Hope reached the Newark factory of the Universal Transportation Company shortly before eleven o'clock that night after an uneventful trip out via the Suburban Railroad Service. He found the big plant gloomy and silent without a light to show that activity was really going on within. In response to a prearranged code of rings on the bell at the great main gates, he was admitted. The ocean flyer had been wheeled to the extreme end of the big aviation field, where she might have plenty of room for her initial rise into the air, and the factory foreman informed Alan that all was now ready for departure at any minute. Ned Napier arrived within ten minutes after his chum. Although he had sustained no actual mishap on the way out, it was by sheer luck only that he escaped the trap which had been laid for him. He had attended the performance at the Winter Garden, purposely leaving early. In the foyer, as he went out, a stranger in full evening dress, apparently one of the spectators finishing his between-acts cigarette, accosted him with extreme politeness. "'Dear gentlemen, your pardon,' said he. "'But are you not Mr. Edward Napier, the aeronaut?' No, Ned answered him coldly. My name is Lloyd Jenkins. I am a traveling shoe salesman. My mistake, then, laughed the stranger lightly. Just to show that there's no hard feelings, won't you join me in a little drink down at the bar? No, thank you, the boy answered. I never use intoxicating liquors. And then, being already suspicious brushed on past the stranger and out into the street. The usual line of taxicabs lined the whole curb on both sides of Broadway for a block or more. As soon as Ned appeared, there was a hoarse-voiced chorus of shouts. Taxi! Taxi cab, sir! This way, sir! Taxi cab! Several of the chauffeurs crowded around Ned, trying to persuade him to patronize them rather than their fellows. One driver, muffled deep in a fur-collared overcoat, even went so far as to lay his hand on the boy's arm. "'I have a big, comfortable limousine car here,' he said. "'Same price as those stuffy little taxis.' Out of the corner of his eye, Ned just then saw the persistent stranger of the theater lobby coming out of the entrance toward him, and, not being anxious for any further acquaintance, the boy turned hastily to the chauffeur, saying, "'All right, your limousine for me.' "'Where to, sir?' Ned was properly cautious. "'Grand Central Station,' he answered, intending then to change to another taxicab, which could double on his tracks and take him on to the rendezvous in Newark." The gentleman in evening clothes was hurrying toward Ned, signaling wildly for him to wait. "'Drive ahead,' called the boy to his chauffeur, and plunged into the black, cushioned depths of the big limousine. Ned kept right on going through, however, tore open the door on the opposite side, and was plunged headlong to the pavement by the sudden rush of the machine as it fairly leaped into high speed." There, in the gloom of the car, he had vaguely observed the uneasy stir of a man hidden beneath the heaped-up rugs in the corner. The boy raced across the street, dodging whizzing motors, and, heedless of angrily honking horns, sprang inside the nearest taxicab and yelled to the driver, "'Give her all the juice you can! Five dollars extra if you can get me to Brooklyn Bridge within twenty-five minutes!' "'I'll do my darndest, the chauffeur, a grizzled man of fifty, assured him. They were off in a jiffy amid a grating of gear shifts and thunderous explosions of the opened exhaust. The motor began to whine as the gas was fed more and more rapidly. The white glare of Broadway slipped past the cab windows in a dull blur. Traffic policemen's whistles were merely unheeded incidentals of the mad race.' 
peering back through the little window in the rear of the machine, Ned saw at least two other automobiles join in the pursuit from the front of the theater. The big limousine was one of them. The stranger in evening clothes and another man were craning their necks out of the other. Turn over onto Fifth Avenue and double up and down some of the side streets as fast as you can, called Ned through the speaking tube to his chauffeur. Never mind about Brooklyn Bridge. There are two machines behind that I want to shake off our trail. All right, boss, replied the chauffeur. You just leave it to Barney O'Dorgan to lose any other chasing taxi in this old town. From then on, it became a game of hide-and-go-seek. Finally, away over on the east side, it looked as if the pursuers had been shaken off. No sign of them had been apparent for at least half an hour, and Ned was just congratulating himself when the car turned a corner, and right there, at a standstill under the arc light, in the center of the otherwise deserted street, stood the big limousine with the three men arguing violently beside it. Chauffeur Barney O'Dorgan caught sight of it as soon as Ned did. Simultaneously, the trio recognized their lost quarry and started toward it at a run. There was neither time nor space for Barney O'Dorgan to turn his car about, so, as cool as you please, he simply threw his gear lever as far as it would go, flooded the cylinders with gas, and the taxicab began to race backwards at as furious a pace as it had previously gone forward. Seeing their prey escaping, all three of the pursuers jerked revolvers from their coats and opened fire. Two bullets shattered the windshield in front of intrepid Barney's face. Another tore its vicious way through the wooden body of the cab and embedded itself with a dull thud in the back wall not a foot from Ned's head. All of the other shots went wild. Two blocks down this side street and the cursing pursuers were left more than half of that distance behind. Then chauffeur Barney reversed his gears, turned the machine about, and sped on his way, with Ned exulting behind him. Barney, you're a peach, and you won't ever regret the way you've stuck by me tonight, Ned called gratefully. Oh, that's all right, the Irishman made answer. I knew by your looks that you weren't a crook, and I certainly wouldn't let that gang of highbinders nab you. Where to now, sir? The driver certainly had proved himself trustworthy, so Ned decided to tell him his true destination. Have you gasoline enough to drive me to the plant of the Universal Transportation Company in Newark? he asked. Plenty of gas, grinned Barney, but I'm not so sure about the air in my tires. Wait until I look at them. The tires proved hard and sound, however. Once more, Barney took the wheel, and from there on, the ride to the rendezvous was uneventful. Ned presented the chauffeur with $30 as a reward for his fidelity. That was a mighty close shave of yours, Ned, said Alan, after he had heard the story. But where can Buck Stewart be? It's already past the time we agreed upon. Do you suppose they could have caught him? Not yet, my boys, cried a hearty voice behind them. And there stood the reporter, his clothes rumpled, his hat dented out of shape, and with pockets of bulge with notebooks. There are only two parts of me missing, my camera and cane, and I had to leave them in other hands without stopping to argue about it. Then Buck told the story of his thrilling night's experiences, and mutual congratulations followed. "'Well, I guess that we've given them all the slip at last,' said Alan. "'And since it's a way past the hour we fixed for starting, let's take our places aboard the flyer and be off. We haven't any too much time to lose, you know.' right -o, echoed Buck and Ned. So the trio made their way to where the huge airship stood ready. They swung up the ladder into the main port. Ned took his position in the pilot room. Buck in the engine room. Alan made a hasty survey of the vessel, poking around here and there with a powerful hand searchlight to see that all was as it should be. 
Their hearts beat high with excitement, which likewise agitated the little group of factory mechanics who had gathered to see them off. Just as Ned was about to signal Bob for their start, there came a tremendous battering upon the great barred doors of the factory. "'Open and admit us!' roared an authoritative, bull-like voice. "'Let no man leave here before we enter, in the name of the United States of America!' End of chapter 7 Recording by Tom Hirsch